Good morning, and welcome to Decoa First United Methodist Church, where it is our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ and to give ourselves in His service by being one church with one mission. We continue this morning in our series on the book of Ephesians. As we've said, there are three basic themes to the book of Ephesians. There is the theme of ecclesiology, which are teachings about the church and, and life in the church. The theme also of Christology, which is the teaching about Jesus Christ and our relationship to him. And then the third theme is the theme of ethics. How do we take these teachings about our being a part of the church, about our relationship with Jesus Christ, and apply those teachings to everyday life? On the first message that we had in this series, we talked about the church and, and how we are to relate to one another within the confines of the church. Last week, we talked about Christ and the importance of having a relationship with him and not simply head knowledge of Jesus Christ. And today, we're going to have a merger of all three of these themes. We're going to speak briefly of life in the church. We're going to speak briefly about the teachings of Jesus Christ. And then this text speaks to the ethical implications of what response it should bring about in all of us. So we turn today to the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians, beginning with the first verse. Hear now the word of God. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us were given grace according to the measure of Christ's gifts, Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full statue of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as part of each, working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, I love you, and you love me, and I love these people as you love these people. Now love them through me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I begin this morning with a pastor that was very prominent in the early days of, of my ministry and shaping my ministry. It's a pastor by the name of Carolyn Morris. She was a trailblazer. Carolyn was one of the first female pastors in, in the North Georgia Conference. And later she went on to become the first female district superintendent that we ever had in North Georgia. Her relationship to me became apparent when I was a student pastor at Emory. While I was serving my churches, I was also taking my theological training at the Candler School of Theology at Emory. And Carolyn Morris was assigned as my teaching parish advisor. Now what this meant was that a group of pastors, student pastors, would gather together, discuss issues of church life, practice preaching, and we would be 
receiving the benefit of the lead pastor's guidance and wisdom, and it was Carolyn Morris who provided such guidance and wisdom. Now, the problem with listening to student pastors preach is that they tried to tell everything that they learned and everything that they knew from their seminary classes, and they tried to cram that all into one sermon. And so a lot of the sermons tended to be dense. They, they tended to, to have a lot of theological teaching, but not necessarily a lot of practicality in them. At the end of such a sermon, Carolyn Morris would look at us and utter these simple words. What would you like for me to do? What? What would you like for me to do? I tell that this morning because this is the section of the letter of Ephesians that answers that question. What would you like for us to do? The author of Ephesians, be it Paul or, or someone else, as scholars debate, has spent a few chapters now speaking of the Lordship of Christ. They have dwelt on the church as being heirs of Christ. But now we're into a transitional passage. The basic writing style of, of Paul and those who emulated him was simply this, that they would offer a section on teaching and then there would be a section that would be called the therefore section, which would be the, the teachings on ethics and the practical application of what was taught. And today's passage is the transition from theology to application. We move to the therefore section in our study of the book of Ephesians. And the question that is before us this morning is simply, how are we to allow Jesus Christ to shape us? How are we to allow Jesus Christ to form you and I into the people that, that he would have us to be? When we begin with the understanding that we are a called people, we are called by Jesus Christ into his ministry and into his service. Listen to these words from our passage this morning. I beg you, I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. The key emphasis here is that we are called. When Jesus was baptized, he went from his baptism into the beginnings of his ministry. His ministry flowed out of his baptism, out of his experience in the water, out of his baptism, out of his receiving of the Holy Spirit at his baptism. Conversely, our baptism, too, calls us into service. We are sent forth from our baptism as ministers in Christ's name. Baptism not only confers upon us the means of grace, washes us with the Holy Spirit, initiates us into the family of God, it calls us into service in the kingdom of God. Each and every one of us who are followers of Jesus Christ has a calling placed upon our lives and that calling is for us to be faithful servants of Jesus Christ. The story is told in the Middle Ages of King Henry of Bavaria. He went to a monastery seeking to be a more faithful disciple, a more faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And he goes to the abbot, to the head of the monastery. He sat down with the abbot and outlined his desires, his desire to be obedient to God. And he thought that by doing this, he needed to become a part of this monastic order. The abbot looked at him and said, do you want to be obedient? 
He said, yes. And he said, do you want to be obedient to the commands that, that I give you? And he said, yes. He said, well, here is my command. You return to your throne and be an obedient king. Friends, wherever we are in life, whatever our occupation in life may happen to be, whatever our station in life may happen to be, we are called in that occupation and in that station to be obedient. We are called in that occupation and in that station to be faithful. We are called to be the best that we can be in that occupation. Whether one's a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, whether one's a doctor, a lawyer, an Indian chief, whether one's retired or whether one's a student, we are called to serve God in the place in which we occupy ourselves, the place that is the occupation in which we're engaged, the vocation to which we are here. We are called to serve God through those efforts. Even if we're retired, we are called to serve God in our retirement. Because you see, none of us ever retire from being baptized. Whatever we do, we're called to serve while doing it. We are a called people. I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, for there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all and in all. We have the call of God placed upon our lives. And because we have the call of God placed upon our lives, we are called to build up ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ. Ephesians goes on to say, we must no longer be children We must no longer be children. In other words, we are called to build up ourselves. We are called to grow in our faith. My friend Stump was at a gas station down near the interstate in his hometown of Dublin one day. And as he was there gassing up his car, a a tourist stopped off at at the particular gas station and looked over at Stump while he was pumping his gas and said, are you from from here? And Stump said, yes. He said, well, tell me, have there been any great men born here? And Stump looked at the tourist and said, no, there's only been babies that that have been born here. (laughs) truth is, we're born as babies. And when we're born again, we're born again as babies. We're born as infants into the kingdom of God. All of us, whether we're brought to the font and baptized as an infant, or whether we come to Christ later in life, all of us begin our journey in faith as a baby as an infant and we grow we grow into the Christian that God wishes for us to be the problem though for many Christians is that they begin with a Bible school faith a very simple childlike faith and indeed Jesus has taught us that we are to receive the kingdom of God as a little child But the scriptures also teach us that we're expected to grow in our faith. School started in our community this week. 
And you know what? Most every child that was a first grader last year is not a first grader this year. They're a second grader. And most every child that was a second grader last year is not a second grader this year. They're a third grader. And most every child that was a third grader last year is not a third grader this year. They're a fourth grader. And you're sitting there thinking, is he going to go through all 12 grades? Well, well, no, I'm not. But I think we see the point. We expect our children to, to grow intellectually. We expect them to mature. And so it is that Christ also expects all of us to grow in our faith, to mature, to become the people that he would have us to be. called to mature spiritually. Not to make us a super Christian. Not to make us better than anyone else. Not to make us more perfect, more holy than our brothers and sisters in Christ. But rather we're called to mature, to grow closer to God. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine. by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful schemes. We must no longer be children. We're called to build up ourselves, to grow spiritually as followers of Jesus Christ. And we're called to build up the church. Ephesians goes on to say, by speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knitted together by every ligament which is, it is equipped as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth and building itself up in love. Now if you listen to the metaphors here, it's fairly clear that the scripture here is talking about the church. Speaking of the church is the, the body of Christ. And so we as a church have to ask ourselves, are we engaged in building up the body of Christ? Are we engaged in growing as a congregation? I suspect this morning if I were to ask each of you to give me one word to describe our church, most of you would say, well, well, it's friendly. It's friendly. And you know what? I went down the street to the Presbyterian Church and asked them that same question. They would say, well, yes, we're friendly. If I went up the street to First Baptist, they would say, well, yes, we're friendly. If I went down to St. Matthias and asked the Episcopalians, they would say, we're friendly. I suspect if I went to every church in Stevens County and asked them to describe themselves, they would say they're friendly. You know why? Because the people who came there and didn't find them friendly have left. So yes, we're friendly to each other. Nothing wrong with that. I would hope that's the way we are. But being friendly is not necessarily a sign of a church that is growing. Now there are three basic ways that a church grows. Numerically. Numbers. Are we an inviting place? Do we seek to have other people come and be a part of our fellowship? Survey after survey tells us that what attracts people to a church isn't the denominational label on the door. In fact, at times that's often a hindrance. What attracts people to the church isn't necessarily the doctrines. What attracts people to the church isn't necessarily having the most charismatic pastor. Although, come on, yours looks pretty cool this morning, doesn't he? 
What attracts people to the church are the relationships that its members form that bring others to the faith. I'm supposed to invite people to church. I'm supposed to invite people to come and be at this place. That, that's what people expect from me. That's my job. And I do it. But the truth is, 78% of the people who become a part of a church do so because they've received an invitation from a lay person, from someone who is a part of that church. And those numbers are pretty consistent in survey after survey after survey. Friends, our lay people are the key to bringing more people into our church because people respond most importantly to relationships. They respond to those who love and trust them. So to grow numerically, it's about our building relationships in our community with our families, with our friends, with our neighbors, our co-workers, our acquaintances. It's also about cultivating community and, and fellowship within the confines of our own church. And it's about being in service to our world. An important question to ask this morning, to ask of ourselves, is simply this. If the First United Methodist Church were to close tomorrow, would it make any difference in the lives of the people of Tacoa and Stevens County? Would it make any difference in the lives of someone else in the world? That is how we grow as a church and how we build up the body of Jesus Christ.